This episode of Selling with Social is being brought to you by STAR, the sales team Alpine Retreat, a Frost and Sullivan executive mind exchange taking place this February 7th through 9th, 2018 in Lake Tahoe, Nevada. And now to Selling with Social. People often can talk about finance in a narrow sense of yeah. accounting and controlling and so forth, but there's nothing to count or to control if we don't have sales coming in the door. If we don't have customers buying something, there are no numbers, you know, then there's only cost. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez Jr. You're now listening to Selling with Social. Toby Carrington, my friend, I am so glad that you've joined me today on Selling with Social. Thank you for joining us on this podcast. Mario, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so as I look at your background, I think it's important that our listeners understand who you are. First off, Senior Vice President and Head of Global Sales Operations at Siemens Health and Ears. You've had a fairly good track record there at the organization, and you're part of the spinoff that's taking place right now, or that has taken place. So do me a favor, Toby, just give our listeners, tell us who you are, what your background is, and a little bit about your business focus on sales, sales operations, etc. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mario. Yeah, look, very exciting times for us here at Siemens Health and Ears. You know, we are being spun off separate from the the mothership and, you know, very exciting times for us in our industry. Yeah, I've been with Siemens for over 15 years, actually, in a variety of different commercial roles, financial roles, and more recently, strategy and sales operations. So, you know, very exciting time, particularly in the, you know, the fast pace of change with regard to digital enablement and so forth. And, you know, really exciting for us to think about the future of sales at Siemens Health and Ears and how we can get closer to our customers and really enable them to go to greater success. Yeah, you know, one of the things I noticed about your profile and your background, Toby, was you were actually the vice president of finance for Siemens before you went into actually the sales operation, sales strategy role. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I've moved around a bit. I'm originally Australian, if you know the listeners couldn't work that out. But I've <laughs> worked in, in Germany, in Singapore, now most recently for the last few years, uh, New York's been home. And I had a variety of different finance roles, broader operations roles, commercial roles, and yeah, in strategy and sales operations recently. And, and I think, you know, they all have a common thread, which is for me, it was always about supporting the healthy growth of our business in whatever function I was in. Well, and the finance people would know <laughs> all about making sure that there's a healthy growth of the business. That's your job is to figure out those types of things and how to grow the business. So I'm excited to actually talk about some of the strategies related to enablement and operations today. And also, you're going to be actually speaking, if I'm not mistaken, at the Frost and Sullivan event, February 7th through the 9th in Lake Tahoe on a topic, and I think it's called Balancing Resources to Meet Increasing Demand for Operational Support. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm really looking forward to that event. And the topic something that's really close to my heart because, you know, in whatever industry that our listeners are in, whether it's med tech or healthcare like myself, there's challenges which come from consolidation, digitalization, you know, growth, or even, you know, going the other way, organizations which are shrinking, having to become more competitive, there's a lot of you know, market forces which are shaping an organization. And the topic is really about all aspects of our organization needing to work together to focus on the customer. And I think this is important, honestly, for all organizations, whether it's a human resources person, a legal person, finance person, whatever it is, to actually really understand an organization's strategy and make sure that the objectives of their individual function within an organization are working towards the overall company's company strategy. And I think that's not always the case. You know, having competing priorities and so forth is, you know, is a common issue that, you know, medium and larger organizations in particular face. And so, you know, that's what the talk is going to be about. The session's really going to be about, you know, practical ways 
that an organization can align all of these different functions to focus on the customer and to focus on enabling their sales force. Now, we talk a lot about this concept of focusing on the customer, Toby. And it's a, I think it's a talk track that many, many executives talk about, but really, really actually applying it. What I have found has been fairly not widely adopted, especially down at the lower levels. And I want to come back to this concept you talked about, which is being what I call hashtag customer obsessed, <laughs> focus on the customer. I want to come back to that. But before we come back to that, do me a favor. Our listeners love to know this. Tell us one thing about yourself that we wouldn't find by looking at your social profiles. <laughs> okay. I mean, Keep looking PG, at my would you? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I'll try my best. No, I mean, looking at my social profile, you might see that actually over here in New York, I'm on the board of the Australian Rules Football Club here in New York. And, you know, Australian rules football actually is one of the largest amateur sports here in the US, you know, because you have you actually have professional sport, college sport, and then kind of social sport. There's not a lot of large nationwide organized amateur sports. But what you won't find on my social profile is that I've also been playing again the last few years. So, you know, let's say it's been at least seven or eight years since I last pulled on the boots but I've actually been playing again. I again retired a couple of weeks back. We had our national championships in San Diego. So I've you know, just recently retired again, but you wouldn't see that on my social profile. And it's certainly been a source of amusement for my wife. Ah, uh, gotcha. Well, I recently just saw a picture of a executive vice president of sales strategy who posted a video on LinkedIn that he couldn't come to a conference because he was out wakeboarding. And he said, I forgot that I was actually 43 because I was trying to act like a 23 year old. <laughs> and- That's exactly, Mario, why I've, uh, let's say, retired again, because I managed to survive the last three years without really any serious injuries. And I didn't think it'd be a good look if I couldn't turn up to the, you know, any of these sales conferences or whatever, because I broke my leg or something like that. Exactly, exactly. All right, well, you be careful out there. So coming back to this topic of focusing on the customer, and as I mentioned, becoming customer obsessed, this is an area that I think is a big challenge for many organizations in terms of process, procedures, methodology on what the impact is of a change. And the change could be, you know, growth, it could be constriction in the business, right? And always coming back to being customer obsessed and how does this impact the customer or how do we have the least amount of disruption to the customer experience? Do you think that this is like, based on your comments, I'm thinking you think this, but do you believe that this is a cornerstone, a diamond that needs to be focused in on by organizations that is not effectively done today? Or do you think that organizations are truly doing a good job at becoming customer obsessed in all departments? No, I mean, I'll challenge the statement a little bit. I mean, it's not the only thing. Yeah. I mean, organizations have a lot of other stakeholders, you know, whether that be investors, uh, employees, you know, media and so forth, right? And so all of those things have to be balanced. And there's different points of view on this. Of course, you know, Jeff Bezos is one of the, from Amazon, of course, is one of the people that talks a lot about customer obsession as well. But you can also look at organizations like Virgin with Richard Branson, where his first focus is on keeping the employees happy with the goal that ultimately they will, you know, happy employees will result in happy customers. So I think it's absolutely right to be obsessed and focused on having an organization geared around customers. But that's also, you know, there are different enablers. So you can't focus on customers just at the expense of everything else. There's any organization has a lot of other very important stakeholders. Now, that's a great point in terms of having uh, Richard Branson's approach with Virgin and keeping employees happy. And that by default, keeping employees happy will keep customers happy versus Jeff Bezos at Amazon, which is, you know, be customer obsessed and everything else falls in. And I think I hear you saying is it's, it's a balance of many things. Then those two things combined by having that focus, you could really do some great damage in a good way into the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. And that's right. And I mean, the key topic in both situations is that the organization they have to live and breathe that philosophy. You know? So you can't have part of the organization which is only focused on you know, investors and part of the organization, you, know, you can't outsource to human resources to focus on employee engagement. And you can't just say focusing on customers is the job of sales and you know, sales operations, for example, because that's simply not the case. The organization all has to be aligned with the particular focus. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. That's a great sentiments there and great pushback on terms of my commentary on being customer obsessed. Thinking about your 
previous roles, you know, as I looked at one of the things that caught me by surprise was the fact that you were on the finance side and now on the sales operation side. And, you know, there's this interesting thought that happens amongst salespeople, especially when they look at sales operations and sales enablement organizations. And they say, you know, if you haven't carried a bag, you really can't help me do what I need to do. I don't know whether or not you've carried a bag, Toby, but I'd love to get your response on, do you think it's important that those in the sales operations and sales enablement role truly understand the day in the life of a sales rep and the sales leaders? And do you think that that's a requirement that they should be in sales? And if not, and that may be your background, if not, how do you understand what life is like in the world of sales so that you can better help them? Look, I absolutely think that it's vital for any anyone in an organization to understand our customers and a day in the life of a salesperson. I mean, I'll give you a very simple example. When I was the CFO of our healthcare business in Australia or I was the CFO also of one of our divisions in healthcare in, in Asia Pacific. And whatever role a person had working for me in a finance organization of any sort of finance capacity, they had actually in their yearly performance targets requirements once a quarter to spend valuable time with a salesperson in the field and not just on a field trip, actually interacting with our customers in a meaningful way. And that was to make sure that they had a good understanding of challenges and things that were going on in the field. And I think a lot of this is about perspective. Yeah, I mean, people often can talk about finance in a narrow sense of yeah. accounting and controlling and so forth, but there's nothing to count or to control if we don't have sales coming in the door. If we don't have customers buying something, there are no numbers, you know, then there's only cost, right? Yeah. So that's a limited scope. So I honestly don't think that it's necessary to, to be in a support function supporting sales. I don't believe that it's necessary to have worked in sales. For sure, having carried a bag is the best way to get frontline customer interaction. But honestly, there are a lot of touch points now with different people in, in an organization. I mean, you might have a key account management approach, but if you're talking to a head of procurement, if you're talking to a chief financial officer or you're talking to a you know director of a particular division on a customer side, actually having competent, capable people in your own organization who might be in those functions, maybe procurement or finance or so forth, who can talk to their peers in a customer, I've found is an integral part of actually doing deals. So I don't believe in this concept of a salesman with their, you know, Superman underpants on the outside, you know, running around. I believe in the power of an organization supporting those frontline account managers, including, you know, in face-to-face in -face interactions with a customer. Yeah. You know, I think you bring up a really good point, Toby, and that is you had a requirement. You said in the yearly performance targets for your folks was to actually spend time in the field with both reps and customers to understand the pain, the problems, the successes, the growth, the opportunities that then you could turn around, whether you're in finance or whether you're in legal or whether you're in whatever department to figure out how you can actually help enable sales because to your point without sales you're counting nothing other than costs <laughs> that's right um, and, and you know there's a whole variety of things to do there mario like a legal team negotiating a contract if the lawyer understands the lawyer on the supplier side understands where the customer is coming from you know negotiations and things like that just go a lot better it's not just a finance function there's a whole lot of people that, that interact you know i mean in our business a customer service engineer you know will see our customers on maybe a daily basis, a lot more than our sales reps will see them. So making sure that our engineers understand everything about where that customer's business with us is at, those types of things are really critical. A very good point. And I think if you think about it from the perspective of understanding with the intent to help and drive a win and a success, I think that's really key. You know, I've been many a deals, many a deals where we worked with legal and legal would push back or create a term. And where I've said to the finance and legal team in this particular case, you know, I can't sell this. I need your help. So here's what I'd like for you to do. I'm going to arrange a call with the customer and their legal team and their procurement team. And what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to get on the phone with them and you help me sell this. And what was interesting is, you know, about 50% of the time, they would, well, we don't want to do that. Well, what exactly does the customer want? <laughs> so yeah. sometimes it would work where legal would say, okay, let's, I don't want to do that. Let's just figure out how to get them what they want. 
And the other times they'd say, all right, well, we're here to help you. And in either case, it accomplished the same goal. And I think that's important in terms of growing a sales organization is that everybody in the operational side, they have a hugely, tremendously important role in helping to advance sales and keep customers happy. And I think you hit the nail on the head, which is focusing in on what is going to make a win-win deal for the customer and for us. And if they are in the field and they're understanding that, it'll make the job a lot easier to be able to support. Yeah. It's a question of mindset, Mario. For me, it's a question of if you understand that a customer is paying your salary, you know, you'll behave accordingly, you know, in, in terms of a focus to actually try to win a deal. I mean, the easiest thing to do in certain functions, the easiest thing to do is say no. Yeah. yeah. But the best way to manage, I mean, if you want to have absolute no risk in your business, then don't do any business. Yeah, but that's the simplest way to have no risk. I mean, inherently, you're going to have risk and you have great opportunities in all of these things. And so having these critical support functions, like we've talked about finance, legal, operations, any engineering, whatever it may be, understanding that the only reason that their roles can exist is because, you know, their contribution is leading to a customer buying something. That's a pretty important step. And, you know, many companies have existed because they made good products that people bought. But, you know, a lot of those companies don't necessarily exist anymore because they failed to pick up on trends which were happening in the market. They failed to listen to their customers and they failed to, let's say, work together with their customers to see what challenges were coming that maybe jointly they could deal with. And there's plenty of examples you can look back at, like Nokia or or BlackBerry or, or so forth, companies that you know, we're in market leading positions, which maybe failed because of internal focus on maybe product development or excellence in engineering or something like that, as opposed to taking a broad view of what was happening with their customers and their market. Well, I mean, a great example of that. I have a few of them I use in my own keynotes, but but think about Blockbuster, right? (laughs) That was such an iconic name. Who doesn't know Blockbuster, but yet they're still not around because they did not respond to customer demands. And what was the customer demand? It was very simple. I want to be able to rent a movie for however long I rent it, and I don't want late fees. Thus, Netflix came. <laughs> well, that's right. And I was actually thinking about that example last night, Murray. I was watching, you know, Stranger Things, you know, that funny TV show, which is season yeah. two, has just been released again on Netflix. And you can have the whole season. You can watch it whenever you like. You're under no pressure, you know, to do anything else and it costs a monthly fee. So, but yet it's exactly the same service as someone like a Blockbuster was providing. Yeah, it's a very good example. Well, and, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head here in terms of, I love what you said, and I'm probably going to put this into a tweet here for this particular show. But if we all remember that a customer is paying our salary and that our contribution is leading to a customer buying something. like That is so important, especially at the sales manager level, at the accounting level, at the operations, at the legal, whatever the role is, to your point, is that without the customer, we don't have much. We don't have a company. And that our contribution is everything, even the janitor, right? That contribution is leading to a customer buying something because it's creating a happy work environment. As an example, in the janitor's case, that happy work environment is leading to good conversations on the phone or in person or uh, hosting customers at a particular facility. Like every single role is if they have that mindset, you're right. It leads to a customer buying something and that is their contribution. Love that one. So we're going to figure out how to put that into a tweet, but that's a really good one there. Yeah. I want to touch, I want to switch places here because you started talking about companies who are responding to and or failing to see trends in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And this happens a lot when you see consolidation that takes place within organizations. You see businesses are disrupted based upon new technologies that have entered into the marketplace. Netflix being as an example with Blockbuster. You also see a lot of mergers and acquisitions by pure just makes great business sense. Like what we did at Vingresso, merging together six influencers under one umbrella, right? So when we think about the trends that are taking place in the marketplace, how does an organization prepare for the growth trajectory and prepare the different pieces of the organization to prepare for growth. Is this something that is a long-term planning, short-term planning? Does it happen one day overnight? Could it be explosive? Give me an idea of what are some of the things that organizations should be preparing for, operationally speaking, to help with the challenge of growth. And then we'll talk about the challenge of actually a shrinking business. Yeah, of course. I mean, look, and this is, of course, my personal view, right? I mean, there's no silver bullet, but what we are facing right now is the next kind of industrial revolution, which is this digital revolution, right? And the pace of change 
now. I mean, just think about the fact that 10 years ago was when the iPhone, the first iPhone came out. So right. the pace of change is extraordinary that we've seen. So, you know, I think it's important for companies to have a clear picture of where they're going, but we're going to have to be more responsive and adaptive because 10-year plans and so forth might take a radical new direction depending on what's going on. So I think you've got to have very clear overarching goals where you want to have, in at least in a medium-term sense, you know, like a five-year plan. I mean, without having a plan, obviously, you don't have any orientation of where you're going. And for me, it's about that you take, you know, very clear and consequent steps towards those plans, but that you're able to adapt in a much faster way than we've been able to adapt before. You know, I mean, it's not like, I mean, there are plenty of examples of companies and our company in Siemens is a great example that have adapted a lot over the years. I mean, you take a company also like a Samsung or, or something like that, which has been able to adapt from a, being a trading company to, you know, an electronics powerhouse that we know now. Whereas you take maybe a company, say, let's think of an example like Kodak. You know, yeah. Kodak was one of the forerunners in digital cameras. Where is Kodak now, right? Mm -hmm. So they still, they had a long-term plan, or at least at some point they discussed it, but they weren't taking consequent steps, you know, getting the organization aligned to make consequent moves towards that overarching goal is important. I mean, if a strategy is just on a PowerPoint slide in a strategy department somewhere, that doesn't help. You've got to mobilize the entire organization. And I just think that the pace of change, which is happening at the moment, requires you know us all to really rethink how nimble and how flexible and how quickly we make, uh, we make decisions. Well, I cannot disagree with you about the digital revolution, thus Vangresso and digital sales transformation. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, who would have imagined such a business would exist, you know, even maybe even five years ago, honestly. Yeah. At Rewind two years ago, right? I mean, like yeah. it was at the potential, just the cusps of this digital sales transformation. Nobody really was talking about that. But today it's almost, if you are not engaged through digital, it was funny, actually, I was talking with a VC firm that is that we've been in conversations with. And they said, you know, talk to me a little bit about what you tell your customers in terms of your case studies of how your programs have actually benefited the organization. And I said, you know, I said, with all due respect, I said, we actually don't have those conversations anymore. And they said, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, think about it this way. Here's how I answer that question of prove to me that your training is actually going to create results. I said, let me ask you a question, Mr. Customer. The question is, out of 100 calls that your reps might make, how many of them actually turn into actual appointments? And the average is anywhere between three and 10, right? Three and 10 is the maximum. So I say, okay, that's fantastic. You've got, even if it was the number 10, you've got some really solid results that are above the national average. Let me ask you a question. You've got 10 out of 100. What happened to the other 90? Yeah. And what are you doing to address that other 90? And in most cases, and this is what I was talking to the VC organization, in most cases, they're not doing anything to address the other 90. So don't ask me what the results are because you don't have a plan to address the 90% that you're not reaching, right? That is this whole digital revolution that we see taking place of needing to become more responsive and adaptive much faster. And you talked about the company plans. I have a theory. I don't know if others will agree with me, but to your point, you know, the 10-year planning model, that's out the window. Forget it. You shouldn't even think that long. In our world and in my organization, we have what's called the five-year focus with a two-year plan. Mm -hmm. And the focus is, is we need to understand a long-term, what is the focus of where we're trying to go? But the two-year plan, because things change so rapidly, new technology, new social network, new whatever might be, that we may have to adjust and respond in like kind. And that's very hard for well-established organizations, especially one like as large as your organization. So how do you do it? Oh, I fully agree. I mean, look, that's obviously one of the reasons why Siemens Health and Ears has been separated to allow us to be faster and more nimble, quicker to make decisions and so forth. But like I said before, I mean, culturally, there's things that need to happen. Yeah, I mean, people need to live and breathe a different behavior. And, and I don't think this is different from, you know, many organizations, small or large, that have yeah. been highly successful. There's a lot of arguments to say if you've only got one way out because you're not doing so well, your back's to the wall or, or so forth, you often react. I mean, the key is while you're ahead of the game, while you're a market leader, being able to move to make some new markets and move on from those traditional successes which you've had. So, you know, for me, that let's say mindset culture is important as well as continuously upskilling. I mean, can you imagine that a few years ago we would have thought about social selling, you know, to take something directly from your realm of expertise, social selling as a core competence of a key account manager, 
right? Right. Or that that it would be an accepted fact that at least in, in our industry, even where we talk about you know big capital purchases, that still more than half of our customers are doing research online, significant research online before they make a purchase. Yeah. There's a very fast need to adapt to this type of digitalization and so forth. And you know the fact is that what the the internet has been great at socializing knowledge. Yeah. So it's not that you have to rely anymore on the expertise of a salesman and whether or not you trust them or believe them. You can just go on a forum and there's a, you know, or a web page or a blog or whatever, and you can get a lot of people's opinions about a product or even about a person or an organization, you know, ranging from some of these websites that talk about how good the company is to work for or how well they're paid or any of these type of things. So, you know, socialized knowledge, the key is actually moving and harnessing those capabilities because the fact is that the organization that's able to grasp within their own you know relevant markets and their relevant spheres what this sort of digital revolution means for them i think will ultimately emerge the winner you know you earlier you mentioned about kodak and where yeah. they were at i just found this out and i hope i'm not misquoting the information i heard last week i was at the sales enablement society 2017 conference and Ori Brofman, New York Times bestselling author, was giving a keynote presentation. And he actually showed a picture. And he showed the picture of what I understood to be the first digital camera. And it was this giant box. It was probably about you know two feet wide and about two feet tall, right? It was like a perfect square or rectangle, something like that. <laughs> and, and he asked, well, what is it to the audience? And nobody knew what it was. And finally, he said, it's a digital camera. And he asked, whose was it? And sure enough, it was actually Kodak. Kodak. Yeah was the one who developed the first digital camera and the leadership team decided to scrap the whole project and said, ah, digital, nobody wants digital. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And I, I think that's where a lot of leaders sit today, Toby. And I love your kind of forward thinking mentality here. Not all leaders, especially on the sales side, are convinced that this digital revolution that we are seeing exists and that they should respond in like kind and it sounds like what you're saying is what you're seeing in your business is that even in your business, your customers are out there doing research prior to picking up the phone and calling a salesperson. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we see that. I mean, the, again, more than half. And I, here I'm not just talking about people involved in purchasing or so forth. I mean, even our C-levels from our customers, they like to receive information digitally or they are spending a lot of their time online looking at LinkedIn and things like that. So there are very clear trends which we see with the people are consuming information digitally. That's nothing particularly new. What I do think though is you know, is new and that's something that, you know, companies are struggling to grasp a little is the topic of uh, data, you know, big data and what you can actually do with all the information that exists. Mm. Because we're in a stage now where predictive analytics, you know, picking the right price, picking the right configuration for your products, these type of decisions can be made better with data. And sales as a profession hasn't actually changed that much. You know, there was always a debate about is sales an art or is it a science or whatever, you know. I actually think sales is a business, you know, where salespeople need to understand the business that they are in and the business that their customers are in. And the fact is data and sources of data will help us with that. I mean, if you just fast forward and imagine a situation, whether you're talking about a wearable or some sort of implantable device that actually has access to all different types of data from the customer, you know, available third-party data and your own internal data whether it be from your CRM system or, you know, any of your web analytics or anything like that, right? You are in a much better position if you can put all that data together, you're in a much better position to come up with something that will suit a customer's needs. And I think this is the type of enablement of a sales organization of the future that's going to be necessary. Having, you know, marketing, finance, whatever type of analytics and support for a salesperson. I mean, it's not going to be a salesperson going alone or maybe having to rely on expert opinion. We will have data and the ability to have sort of, you know, virtual and predictive type models to actually, you know, really help our salespeople do things. And I think that's absolutely correct. And the question then becomes is who helps with that? Is it an operations or is it an enablement role? And before you answer that question, we're going to take a quick one minute break for this program announcement. And we'll come back and answer that question of who helps. 
I'm excited to mention Vingresso's partnership with Frost and Sullivan on the launch of the sales team Alpine Retreat, STAR for short. Vingresso is proud to be a partner for the event, and I'll also be presenting a session on digital selling strategies and tactics. If you're not already familiar with Frost and Sullivan's star executive mind exchange, you're missing an amazing opportunity to participate in what will be the most important sales leadership think tank ever. I encourage you to join us at star February 7th through the 9th, 2018 in Lake Tahoe, Nevada. As an event partner, we're super excited to extend a $250 savings to all Vingresso event attendees. For more information, please visit frost.com forward slash Vengresso. That's frost.com forward slash Vengresso, V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O. All right, Toby, right before we went on that program break there, we were talking about data and analyzing it to make better educated decisions. Well, I said, well, I want to talk about, you know, who helps? Is it sales enablement? or is it sales operations, or is it both? This is an interesting topic because many have talked about in the industry, like what is the role of sales operations? What is the role of sales enablement? Should they be the same organization? Should they be separate? Should they have different responsibilities? Talk to me a little bit about teeing off your concept of big data and taking this data and analyzing it, helping to make better decisions and equip our sales organization. Where does that role fall? Is that in operations? Is that in enablement? Or is that somewhere else? Look, I mean, it's an interesting question, right? Because a couple of years ago, if you would say to someone that you're in sales enablement, people would scratch their heads and wonder what that actually meant, right? (laughs) Right. Um, So, I mean, I can tell you in our organization, you know, sales operations and sales enablement are one and the same. I mean, we are an organization which is geared around how do we best enable, best equip our sales force now and into the future. And that involves, obviously, tools you know, using this big data to make the right decisions. But of course, there are still processes and things which need to happen in sales for us to be most efficient. Yeah. You know, for me, it's a having ways that you do things and let's say having certain metrics and certain approaches and standards and so forth, which you typically do in sales operations, they are just becoming more and more enabled with digital technologies and so forth. And you can't, I don't think from a personal standpoint that you can separate the topics in the same way that I don't believe you can separate, you know, other topics which are going on in an organization. I think they all have to be geared around the same thing, which is supporting the sales force. Do you think that globally speaking, that it's enablement should be a separate function? Obviously, it's the same in your organization, but do you think it should be a separate function outside of operations, both reporting through the sales organization or maybe one through the chief operating officer, or do they have to coexist in the same organization? I mean, the activities have to be able to coexist. Every organization organizes themselves in different ways where certain things report and, you know, in big organizations, there's always a matrix one way or the other. That for me is not so important. What for me is important is that you've got the same strategic goals for our organization that's to equip, you know, the modern sales force in all aspects of operation and enablement. That is the critical topic. I mean, I certainly wouldn't, you know, pretend to want to give the listeners a lecture on, you know, what's the best organizational setup because, you know, everybody is different in that regard. But the topic of an aligned strategy and a way of making sure that the goals are aligned and that there's a regular touch base to make sure that everyone's going in the same direction at the same speed, or at least that, you know, anything which is on, let's say, a critical path to be delivered is working. That's the most important topic. And there you have it, alignment, (laughs) alignment, alignment, alignment of business, alignment of thought, alignment of focus. And I love what you said. It's actually one of my, my new keynote for 2018 is the modern buyer requires a modern seller. And you just mentioned that's a key focus of operations and enablement is modernizing the sales force to be able to reach out and attract and engage the modern buyer, right? That's absolutely right. I mean, and it's not that, you know, when I talk about customer focus and listening to customers, this is vitally important. But I think everyone would also recognize that there are some customers also don't know what is necessarily happening in their industry or are not necessarily best equipped to tackle those things. So customers in an industry are also looking for partners, thought leaders and so forth to work with as industries consolidate, as you know, there are the approach to modern business is is going to go more towards partnership and working at a different 
deeper level, you know, than always a kind of a transactional level. That's my personal belief. I cannot disagree with you. And I think the stats prove it, that buyers are expecting sales people to become, well, we've talked about this word. We've used this since I was in the beginning of when I had my first software sales job, which was at 19 years old, working for an EDI software company, was the consultant, right? The consultative sales approach. And I yep. think it's been, it's a very cliche term that's used, but it's even more important now that as you engage with a particular buyer, They're expecting you to understand the trends that are taking place in the marketplace, the trends that are taking place with like customers, the challenges that others are having and the solutions that are being brought to the table and what the benefits of those solutions are. And then also not just applying the solution, what's the forward thinking one year out look like on the horizon, right? And they're expecting the salespeople, whether you are having a first time conversation or whether you are, you know, a long timer. I think it's just a general expectation that you have that knowledge and you're equipped to have those conversations. Correct. I think I would go a step further, Mario, as well. I mean, you know, being a consultant is good. I mean, we also, you know, I'm sure you've worked with a lot of consultants who give you a lot of advice, but then, you know, it's always your fault that you didn't implement if something goes wrong, right? Right, right. So I think there's an extension on that, having skin in the game and, you know, working on different types of business models, different types of approaches to truly partner together with customers. So yeah. absolutely, absolutely agree with you. I would just say there's an additional step that's there to be explored. I think this was a fantastic conversation, Toby. We've covered quite a few items. We've covered sales operations and enablement. What is it and where do they cross over? We've talked about being customer obsessed. We've talked about keeping employees happy, growth and scaling, alignment, the digital revolution. I think we've covered a lot, man. <laughs> this has been no, a great- I, always, I always like talking to you, Mario. Always very enlightening. You know, before we exit out of this, if somebody wants to get a hold of you and connect with you, what would be the best way for them to reach out to you? Let's keep it all digital and modern. I'd say that the best way is look me up on LinkedIn. And send you a personalized connection request or message, correct? I hope so. That'd be great. It'll otherwise get lost in the noise of everybody who's doing something automated and not personalized. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. I love it. And let me ask you this question. This is a question I always ask all of my guests as we close out the show here. Your all-time favorite movie. What is it? (laughs) Braveheart. Braveheart. Ah, I don't think we've had that one on the show before. Tell me why. (laughs) Well, I like all movies in that sort of uh, ilk, like Gladiator and so forth. I just remember Braveheart being one of the first movies I saw where it was really sort of realistic violence and so forth. But I loved the fact that even though it was a really violent movie, it had kind of a great story to it. So, and of course, you know, I like Mel Gibson. So uh, now a shout out to Mel, but that's probably the reason. Well, maybe we'll get him to tweet us back on this show when we publish it. (laughs) (laughs) If he's listening, I'd be surprised, but you never know. I'd be... uh, You never know with social, Toby. We can have far reach here. (laughs) You never know. You never know. Well, Toby, it's been fabulous having you on the show today, Selling with Social. I want to thank you for joining me and for being part of the program. You've provided some phenomenal insights, and I really... I'm looking forward to hanging out and meeting you in February, February 7th through 9th in Lake Tahoe at the Frost and Sullivan Star event. Barry, always a pleasure. Thanks very much, mate. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining me on that episode of Selling with Social. I hope you found as much value in that episode as I did. Here's what I want you to do next. Please go to www.vengresso.com. That's V N G R E. V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. And make sure that you get access to our content. We've got the latest and greatest in digital sales, sales training, content marketing, and social selling strategies that are going to help you grow your sales pipeline. I look forward to having you on the next show of Selling with Social. Make sure you also go to vengresso.com forward slash podcast to be able to get access to the latest and greatest Selling with Social episodes along with any of the other episodes that we've got from Social Business Engines with my friend and partner, Bernie Borges, along with Conversations with Phil with my friend and partner, Phil Gerbashak. Thanks again for joining on Selling with Social. <laughs>